Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to give it just a couple more minutes. Let people come in from the from the waiting room. We'll get started very soon. Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our seminar series, which is co-hosted by the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego and the Center for the Study of International Migration at UCLA. My name is Claire Adida, and I'm co-director of CCIS at, here at, at UC San Diego. And uh, thanks for joining us to discuss Does Skill Make Us Human? Migrant Workers in 21st Century Qatar and Beyond. Before we begin, just want to say a quick note about our programming. Our next Zoom program will be on March 3rd at the same time, 12 to 1.30 p.m. Pacific. We'll have the pleasure of welcoming Pablo Yankilovich, who is professor researcher at the Centro de Estudios Históricos of El Colegio de México. We'll discuss his book entitled The Others, Race Regulations and Corruption in Mexico's Migration and Naturalization Policies, 1900 to 1950. And our discussant then will be Professor Grace Peña Delgado, who's Associate Professor of History at UC Santa Cruz. And you can find out more information about this event and all our other events on our website, as well as on CSIM's website. But today we're very excited to welcome Natasha Iskander, who is the James Weldon Johnson Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy at New York University's Wagner School of Public Service. Professor Iskander will be presenting her most recent book, The Skill Make Us Human, Migrant Workers in 21st Century Qatar and Beyond, which was published in 2021 by Princeton University Press, just in time for the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. Our discussant, who will be joining us very shortly, is Vanessa Ribas. She's Associate Professor in Sociology at UC San Diego. So the order of activities today, uh, Natasha is going to give us about a 25 minute overview of her book. She's got some slides for us. After that, Vanessa will give us a 10 minute comment and Natasha will then will have, a, have an opportunity to briefly respond. And then we're going to open it up to you, the audience. Um, at that time, you can either electronically raise your hand and we'll call on you and unmute you so you can ask your question live. Or if you prefer, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and write out your question and I will pose the question to the author. author. Um, and with that, we will, uh, we are thrilled to let Professor Iskander uh, take it from here. Thank you so much, Claire, and thank you so much to CCIS for having me. Um, I'm just going to ask you for your patience for a second while I share my screen. Okay, there we go. Can everyone see this? Okay, I'm going to assume yes. Um, so uh, this talk uh, is around my book, Does Skill Make Us Human? Um, the book looks at contemporary debates about Qatar and also contemporary debates about skill. And it asks uh, very pertinently, does skill make us human? It also asks, is skill another word for freedom? In other words, what are the political consequences of defining some people as skilled and some people as unskilled? These questions have important implications for labor rights and worker dignity, power, autonomy around work, 
Um, and this book explores these questions by looking at the experience of migrant workers in Qatar's booming construction industry in the lead up to the 2022 World Cup, which I hope you all had at least a little bit of a chance to catch. I started this project shortly after Qatar was awarded the hosting rights for the World Cup in 2010. Uh, Qatar began the massive construction required for the games almost immediately, funneling hundreds of billions of dollars to reinvent itself as a global destination for sports and culture. And, you know, the, the total tally was over 200 billion, which if you divide it by citizen was close to 2 million per citizen invested in the reinvention of Qatar as a site for the World Cup. I'm sure that many of you had the opportunity to see the beautiful stadia uh, that hosted the World Cup games, but alongside the stadia, hotels and infrastructure that was featured on your TV screen, Qatar also built a number of stunning cultural and educational buildings during this period, and I want to take you inside one of them. Uh, this on your screen is the Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies on the edge of Education City, which is a complex of overseas campuses. Um, and this building contains a faculty and a mosque. It's designed as a three-dimensional gesture of Islamic calligraphy. Um, the design is meant to capture the relationship between knowledge and faith that is so central in Islam. And it was designed by the Spanish architects Manguera Ivars. The mosque space inside is gorgeous. It's illuminated with hundreds of tiny lights meant to mimic the brilliance of the stars on desert nights. There are gardens of paradise throughout the building. There are internal waterfalls. Um, all surfaces of the building are covered with calligraphy of all time periods and uh, light and shadow are managed to ensure that the calligraphy uh, does not cast a shadow anywhere that a believer might inadvertently step on. The building is a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Uh, the pieces fit together with joints so that the building can move in response to desert winds. The minarets, which are here on the far end of the screen, are designed to look like beams of light that, and they rise uh, 80 meters of, uh, above the ground. They're cantilevered at an incline of 25 degrees, and at their base, there are hydraulic devices that allow the beams to sway in response to the high desert winds. The building is beautiful, but it is also technically extremely complex with highly sophisticated engineering design. Um, and like many of the buildings in Qatar, it represents an unprecedented feat of engineering and design. Um, the building is built around steel rib cages that allow the building to move. As you can imagine, this building was extremely difficult to build. It required an enormous amount of precision work. The cladding, for example, uh, every cladding panel had to match its neighboring cladding panel perfectly, not just because of the calligraphy, but also to allow the building to move seamlessly. Um, there are many technical challenges involved in the building of this building, but what I want to do today is draw your attention to the scaffolding. Um, the construction of this building required the construction of a scaffolding shell to accommodate this detail installation cladding and welding work. The most difficult technical challenge uh, with respect to the scaffolding was the construction of the scaffolds for the minaret. They were freestanding scaffolds, 85 meters or 26 stories high. This is the largest and most elaborate scaffolding structure ever attempted anywhere in the world. And the scaffold, of course, is a living structure. It goes up, it comes down, it's rearranged, it's moved. Uh, what this meant is that hundreds of workers hauled up the material to build this structure, to build this structure, and they did so manually, up dozens of stories, up ladders and temporary stairs. They, they hauled up pipes and joints and planks and swivels and gravel locks and clamps. Each worker handled one ton of material every day. 
they handled it with precision and they handled it wordlessly because the construction site is incredibly loud, um, both because of construction noises and because of the desert winds whipping around them. They assembled these structures, they uh, interpreted construction documents to rearrange them, um, and they did so heroically every single day. On the inside of the building, the workers built an internal scaffold. It was a floating scaffold that followed the internal rib cage across. Um, and what I want to do here is draw your attention to this particular small T-shaped structure um, and show you what this looks like for the scaffolders. These are called hanging scaffolds. Um, and the men who uh, worked on those scaffolds called themselves uh, the men who hang from the sky, and they literally did hang on these T-shaped uh, structures, uh, 17 stories up in the air. Oh. Throughout this whole process, there was not one fall, not one injury from falling equipment, not one mechanical failure. This is remarkable because of the speed up uh, of construction and the hard construction deadlines. Uh, it was remarkable because of the difficult environmental conditions that workers worked in and remarkable because the workers often had no shared language between them. The men who hung from the sky were recruited from all over the world. Uh, the QFIS site had about 10,000 men and over 20 languages were spoken. The site was entirely migrant, 100% migrant. The story uh, of the workforce in construction in Qatar is the story of migration to Qatar. Qatar is the photo negative of the typical migration story. 95% of the workforce is migrant. You can see this in the pie chart here. Um, the uh, entirety of the construction workforce was foreign. Um, out of about a million workers, the uh, Qatari census notes about 1,500 Qatari uh, in, uh, workers in the industry, and those are primarily managers. Um, in the rest of the world, migrants, as you all know, are a small fraction of the labor force, about 17% here in the US. As a result, uh, it becomes very easy to slip into notions of migration being somehow external to the economy and society. Um, and our scholarship engages either implicitly or explicitly with debates about the impact of migration and the entry of migrants on the economy, more pointedly, whether immigrants are a boon or a drag, whether they're entrepreneurs or criminals, Qatar allows us to drop these questions completely and instead calls on us to ask, what happens when people's political rights are tied to their economic function? How does this shape the economy and society? Okay, uh, the, just a quick uh, snapshot. The source countries for the construction workers uh, are all over the world. Um, with a heavy emphasis on South Asia and increasingly Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. Over the decade during which uh, workers were building out Doha in preparation for the World Cup, uh, there was quite a lot of press coverage and human rights analysis of Qatar and uh, these organizations documented an array of labor abuses from wage theft to abysmal living conditions and labor camps to injury and death. Much of the coverage and scholarship on the working conditions in Qatar attributed the extreme labor violations observed to the kafala or sponsorship system. This is kafala in Arabic writing. For most of the decades, sorry, for most of the decade after the hosting rights were awarded, the kafala system was tantamount to a system of formal bonded labor. It formally bound migrant workers to their employers. Uh, the employer as the kafi, which is the singular of kafala, was legally responsible and legally empowered over workers. The kafil could deport workers and control their movements um, throughout the city. Workers were not able to withhold their labor for any reason, including non-payment of, non of wages or abuse. 
Workers could not change employers or quit, and they could not leave the country without their employer's permission. They also could not return to Qatar after leaving for two years without their prior employer's assent. But all foreign workers were covered by the same rules, regardless of wage, occupation, or national origin. And certainly professionals, doctors, executives, hotel managers, lawyers, were not experiencing the same kinds of labor violations. So what was producing the extreme exploitation that construction workers faced in Qatar? In response to the media coverage and international advocacy, which crescendoed as the World Cup approached, Qatar began making changes to its regulatory structure to address the worst of the abuses documented. And these really came at the tail end of that heady decade. Um, but by the time the World Cup was held in 2022, the visa system for migrant workers was in some respects more protective of migrant worker rights than the framework for non-immigrant foreign workers in the US. Most notably, workers were able to change jobs uh, without uh, their employer's explicit permission and quitting their jobs did not automatically entail immediate deportation. These uh, uh, reforms looked great on paper. Um, they were substantial, uh, they were laudable, but the labor violations continued. And here again, only for blue collar workers. So Qatar here uh, shows us that working conditions are not a matter of law, but a matter of power and exploring the dynamics that produce these labor violations are uh, what motivated the book. Um, I wanted to understand what produced the working conditions in Qatar. Specifically, what produced the working conditions for workers labeled unskilled when there was such a tension between, uh, attention uh, according to kind of uh, standard economic theory between these abysmal working conditions and the advanced construction requirements uh, of the buildings being constructed. To understand what was producing the working conditions in Qatar, alongside the absolutely critical role that workers were playing in the construction industry, I conducted research in five countries and in eight languages. I interviewed a broad array of actors from government to industry leaders to workers, and I spent hundreds of hours on Qatari construction, construction sites shadowing workers. I did the research in layers. I started with an institutional analysis of the construction industry in Qatar to understand how work and production was organized. Then I moved on to conducting participant observation on a select number of construction sites to get a better understanding of skill politics as they were developed at work. For reasons that uh, were uh, will become clear, I wanted to focus on companies that uh, that had the reputation for good practices. In other words, I wasn't interested in looking at the companies that uh, had committed the worst kinds of labor violations and had a reputation for exploiting workers. I wanted to look at companies that had reputations for um, fair labor practices because their conditions would point to issues that were structural. So these were large projects with robust regulatory and administrative systems. I also conducted research in sending countries to understand recruitment, and I added a historical analysis to understand the development of the kafela system and the ways uh, the kafela system in Qatar has been uh, and continues to be a product of geopolitical forces and uh, uh, global trade networks that uh, have over two centuries of uh, history. So um, the paradox here is that the million plus migrants recruited to build Qatar's sophisticated buildings arrived with minimal construction experience, if any. Companies on, on site had to invest heavily in training their workforces. 
every aspect of every process on the project site was designed to promote on the job learning. And I mean, every single aspect. Uh, the goal of training workers came before the goal of actually constructing. Um, and this was particularly challenging because companies were not just developing existing skill. They were building something that even the engineers on site were not sure that they were gonna be able to pull off. So they had to develop new skill, skill that was unprecedented. As a result, um, it is uh, fair and appropriate to describe construction sites in Qatar as vast training systems through which thousands of men develop specialized construction skill. Companies design their highly detailed systems to train workers and to measure the development of their skill to adjust that training system. They invested so much in this process that they came to view their training systems as absolutely proprietary and use them to compete on the Qatari market. Companies lived and died based on how well they were able to train their workers. But when I asked the managers and supervisors at projects like QFIS about their workers, they all described them as unskilled, even though they measured their skill development several times a day. They described their master scaffolders their expert welders, their precision cladders, and many others that had skill that was unparalleled anywhere else in the world as unproductive, poor quality, or sometimes just as bodies. It became clear to me that skill meant something other than ability. Managers and supervisors were not referring to ability, but rather were referring to a political category, unskilled, referred to a subordinate political status. The migrants slotted in that category were dehumanized and described as not having the full capacity for freedom. And so their exploitation was made to seem inconsequential and unavoidable. The reason that this was possible is that in denying skill, employers were in effect denying learning. And learning, as anyone who has been a student or who has been a teacher can tell you, is fundamentally an act of freedom. You can compel someone to do something, but you cannot force them to learn. Learning is an intimate process. It requires imagination, connection, trust, desire. It requires, in, in, at its most basic, volition. So in denying learning, employers were denying that workers had the capacity for these human registers. They were denying their capacity for freedom. And you can't deprive someone of rights and dignity that they don't have the capacity for to begin with on a rhetorical level. The argument I'm making about skill in this book is not about bias and assessment. It's not about a mislabeling of skilled workers as unskilled, but rather it is about the political consequences of being labeled unskilled. Ultimately, the label unskilled was used to cast doubt on the full political personhood of workers and to call into question their capacity for and therefore their right to freedom. Qatar highlights the role of skill as a language of power. And in this book, I look at its manifestation in Qatar. But the political language of skill is spoken in many different places and uses the same logic to say much the same thing everywhere. Everywhere skill is a matter of freedom. As I began examining skill, not as a measure of ability, but rather as a political category, it became clear to me how the politics of skill shaped all aspects of social and political life in Qatar. The book examines these facets one by one, from law to urban planning to heat injury and climate change. If we have time in the Q&A, I will touch briefly on how the politics of skill manifested in the production of heat injury, uh, 
on workers' bodies and the response to the rates of injury and death in Qatar. Um, and I can speak to how skill politics provides an alibi for the injuries that workers sustained uh, as a cause of heat um, and uh, how skill politics made workers culpable for their own suffering. But for now, I'll end it there so that we have time for discussion. And I'll just say that one of the very interesting things for me about this project and its uh, engagement with the world is to note the debates around uh, worker exploitation in the lead up to the World Cup. And here I mean specifically November and December of last year. Um, if you uh, had any chance to hear that critique even peripherally, you may have noticed that workers were represented almost uniformly as unskilled and as exploited anonymous brown workers in overalls. Um, their full personhood, their full capacity for the registered associated with skill was denied through in, in all um, interventions in that debate. And so uh, I think that this representation of workers as unskilled uh, has a political valence that is more powerful that, than we may realize in Qatar and far beyond. And I'll end there for now. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, now we're going to turn it over to uh, Vanessa Ribas, who just uh, joined us and is, is a, a professor of uh, sociology here at UC San Diego and will provide a comment uh, on, on the book and presentation. Thanks, Vanessa. And you're muted. But I unmuted. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to join you. Um, nice to meet you, Natasha. Um, so um, I guess what I will do um, is I'll just make some general remarks about um, the book and my, my sort of impression of it. Um, I'll raise a few comments, um, you know, kind of points that still remained a little obscure to me um, and suggest some clarifications that maybe Natasha can make, and then um, and then I'll end with some some questions some questions I'll pose um, that I think the audience, uh, especially if we have graduate students and other um, you know youngish scholars on board, um, I think your answers to those would be really really interesting to us. So. Um, this book uh, demystifies and renders visible so much from the skill politics that structure regulation of migration to those skill politics that amplify the exploitation of workers. From the globally embedded histories that produce the contemporary configuration of state capital control of production relations to the marvels of transforming uh, Qatar landscapes into the surreal visions of its leaders from revealing the partnerships with power that weaponize climate against workers bodies and personhood to the multi-level injuries to earth and human life ways that connect Qatar to the places from which workers are sourced. This book to me is a stunning achievement, bold research, beautiful writing and storytelling, and a subtle tenderness towards the topics, the people, the work, the places, the vistas, the word to me, de demystification, captures this book well, and the theme of embodiment runs throughout as an antidote to the taken for grantedness and even um, banality with which skill is talked about usually. The climate and climate change and power relations are often treated as well. To me, I'll raise a couple of um, questions, topics that remained a little unclear, even as so much was, in my view, demystified. Um, I know very little about the colonial history out of which the Qatari royal family emerged. Um, I don't know very much about relations among Gulf states. And I know even less 
after uh, at this point still about the initially I think tens and perhaps now hundreds of thousands of regular Qatari citizens. Um, in this sense, although the orientalizing timelessness that abstracts sociopolitical regimes such as the kafala system from the global connections and power relations that actually shape them is challenged. I'm still left with a few questions, um, kind of a vague sense only of what the social, political, economic, and cultural life of this place and its people was and is like, but maybe that is the point. So this is a, a, a one question that I would pose to Natasha. Other themes remain a little bit blurry as well. What is and what was during prior eras of intensive resource exploitation and modernist development projects, the balance of power, um, if we could think of that, between Qatari rulers and the global capitalists who converged on scene. First, I think uh, the British, um, but also um, in more recent times, Australian, Indian, Korean, and many others, I'm sure. It wasn't clear to me what the place of the of, of US capital was in this either, but I suppose it uh, could be a point of discussion. Um, are there patterns in the sort of relations that they held to one another? In other words, the, the ruling class uh, and vis-a-vis -vis global capitalists that came to exploit resources during the different eras of intensive um, exploitation and sort of the, the different um, modernization rushes that occurred from the time of pearling through to the oil and gas uh, era, which continues, um, and now into this kind of global project, uh, the, new, the newest of the global projects. Um, I, I think in relation to that, to me, it's, I mean, it's kind of like, a, it's just startling that the, the sort of consistency with which power was held and, and sort of maintained and one wonders how, how, that, how that could be. Um, aside from, you know, if I'm not to just accept, well, this is an authoritarian place and blah, 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 right? Like, you know, uh, beyond sort of that assumption, how did these, uh, you know, global actors at different times, what, what kind of relation, um, what was the balance of power between these actors? There's discussion of that at different points, but it never becomes very clear as like, okay, here's this pattern that, that we can kind of tease out from these histories. To me, it's hard to imagine that either from within or from outside, let's say in sending places or by international labor organizations, that there haven't been subversive groups or social movements of any kind formed or attempted even considering the dire context, uh, conditions of control and risks involved in the authoritarian context, though admittedly, I don't know authoritarian contexts um, uh, at all, right? So, or in any kind of deep sense. So uh, maybe that is uh, as much explanation as is needed. Um, so just to me, if I am, if I can just say it, to me, it's hard to, to sort of envision that why is why is it the case? What what if any politics have sending countries, for instance, pursued? Could you say more about any of the challenges from within, whether by Qataris or non-Qataris? I do recall some discussion of Qataris revolting sometime before or during the early days of oil and gas um, exploitation, but I didn't quite um, gather or understand really what the causes or significance or implications of that were and have been. I think this was involved in the upturning of Qatar's definition of skilled and unskilled, right? Like who initially protecting the Qatari nat nationals um, who were defined as unskilled and, and, and sort of they had certain protections, but then sort of flipping that and, you know, keeping, uh, well, I, well, actually, I don't know what the Qataris do at this point, but um, but sort of flipping that such that it's the foreigners who are the unskilled and, and, and skilled um, and uh, uh, 
that that flip which took place at some point in the late oil and gas era, I think. Um, so anyway, if you could say a little bit about about that, about um, kind of you know resistance, revolt, rebellion, subversion. Um, uh, so I think this was involved a little bit in the upturning of Qatar's definition of skilled and unskilled and the various minimal protections, rights, and standing afforded to its national population versus others. Um, but maybe you could discuss that further and what, uh, relatedly, what's been the impact of the abolition of, of kafala into, into uh, in, you know, these relations. Relatedly, on the ground, at least in the recent history of the construction industry, you discuss the somewhat common in incidents of wildcat strikes that you sometimes observed. But um, I think you, you sort of consider them of little transformative potential, if I understood the argument correctly. On the other hand, the sort of actions that arose from embodied cognition and skill and in which workers drew sometimes across ethno-racial and national lines on their trade expertise and the other qualities and values they positively ascribe to themselves like bravery um, and a sense of camaraderie to enlist actors up the hierarchy in some cause. It seemed to, it see, if I read your argument correctly, that seemed more promising as a transformative um, dynamic there. But I couldn't help feeling this was a little rosy, little, little rosy. Um, and, and the reason was when I went back to thinking about which you were just mentioning at the end of your presentation, the training systems, right? Um, it's, it's, it's almost like all this incredible value <laughs> and this whole social world that's so rich in skillful pra practice and so on and so forth um it's just it's just dismantled time and again um and um the the patents that come out of workers experimentations on these different training sites uh the scaffolders i was thinking about the the, the case of the scaffolders that you talk about where you know it's become kind of also like a a uh, an experimental station for scaffolding. And then the company goes and patents stuff. Um, the way in which workers who have been, have gone through these training systems have, have developed these, this uh, incredible embodied skill. Um, they're just, they're, it's better off to send them home than to keep them around because the proprietary character of that to companies makes it, you know, just more convenient and cost effective for them to start from scratch, even if that means bringing in people who are malnourished, as you discussed in, in one of the chapters. So I guess I, I feel a little bit um, just un unsure about, about that. And I wonder if you could say more. Um, I'll spare you, I think I'm probably almost done with my time or over, I'll spare you the questions about how you were able to get the access that you did. I'm sure that um, it was extremely complicated on many grounds and in the postscript, um, Natasha does talk about that um, to, to a great extent. Um, but the point is that you did, you did get the access that you did somehow. Um, and we have your wonderful book for it. I'm actually more interested in how you came to know construction so deeply that you could use words like cantilevered as if you read, you know, engineering books for fun. Um, and a, a final set of questions, a couple questions that I'd like to pose um, that I'm really interested in and probably others, uh, especially students and, and uh, uh, as well as others like, like me. How did you decide that uh, skill would be the organizing core of your analysis? And the last slide I think that you showed kind of illustrates that you know, skill runs throughout. Um, like, you know, did you just walk us through a little bit of how you came to decide that that, that would be the organizing core of your analysis? 
And finally, as a book writer, what practices did you use to make sense of and organize what had to have been like a, just an incredible mass of data, field notes, interview, archival data, and more? Thank you. Those are such wonderful questions. Thank you, Vanessa, for, for such a careful and thoughtful read of the book. Um, I thought it might be easiest to take them uh, in the reverse order, just maybe putting the book writing process on the shelf for just a second. Um, how I got interested in construction. Um, I, I got interested in construction because I had done a project actually in the US. Um, uh, in my first book, I looked at um, how processes of migration generated all sorts of different insights and knowledge about um, policy. And in the process, uh, I also observed how that different kinds of knowledges moved across borders. And um, as anyone who's done research on migration in sending countries can tell you, a lot of this happens through home construction. So I became really interested in how uh, the tacit knowledge involved in home construction um, moved across borders with a particular focus on the US-Mexican border. And I designed a study uh, looking at construction in Philadelphia and Raleigh-Durham with a focus on Mexican workers. And um, the initial hypothesis was that Mexican workers would take back some of the construction techniques to Mexico and build, you know, California style house, houses, Philadelphia style row homes, whatever. It turns out that none of that was true. And that what was happening was that uh, Mexican construction workers were filling a training gap in the US and uh, compensating for the evisceration of construction training, training institutions, which are unions um, by building kind of deep, and holistic uh, construction skill. Um, so anyway, all of that to say was that I had some, uh, some understanding of construction, but it certainly was not the kind of understanding that I needed to develop to do the analysis in Qatar. And as my research assistant used to say, my idea of fun on a Friday night was looking at construction documents. So, I mean, I think that there is a way in which to do this kind of research, you have to invest in developing the ancillary industrial knowledge. And I spent a fair bit of time investing in that. And I don't know that that's something that we talk about explicitly as social scientists, kind of what it takes to learn how to do this stuff. Um, and you know, a lot of my shadowing workers had to was based in part on the fact that I needed to understand what they were talking about. I needed to learn from them. And so, you know, I participated in a lot of the kind of the training interactions to understand like, what were they doing? How did that relate to a construction document? Were they reading the construction documents? You know, there were all of these like high tech systems on site from, you know, BIM modeling and 4D modeling and like these really complex manpower management systems. And they were really deeply theoretical with, with a lot of slippage with what was happening on site. And I really had to invest in learning those systems and in learning what it meant for how things were managed on site. Um, and I, I'm really grateful for that because that really helped me understand um, both some of the, I mean, it helped me understand a series of things from the systems of control, the what made the training systems proprietary and how workers were able to use skill to resist. So um, I, I wanna dovetail back into your question on wildcat strikes. And it's true, there were wildcat strikes all over the place. But because 100% of the workforce was, uh, was on a temporary labor visa, those wildcat strikes, if they breached certain parameters, were ended through deportation. And, and like in a very ruthless and immediate way, people pulled from their beds in the middle of the night. And you know this happened on, on sites that I was on. So the possibility of a sustained resistance movement that looks like what we think about a resistance movement looking like was not possible. And here is where we start to see what happens 
if your political rights are tantamount to your economic function. You don't have a right to residence. You don't, you're not part of a community where anyone has a right to residence. You don't have any rights that aren't attached to your fulfilling your labor function, right? And so um, we see that a little bit in the US, right? Where um, some workers are more vulnerable than others, but they, they have, they benefit from what I term devolved rights. If you're on a work site, you're benefiting from some rights that are um, afforded to non-immigrant workers, uh, to citizen workers, to workers who have legal statuses that make deportation difficult, and um, you are benefiting from a legal structure where most people are not deportable. And so you're benefiting from some of those rights in Qatar that just does not exist. And so you see some of these things in really high relief. Under those, con in that context, the skill-based strategies were the only strategies. And so the rosy analysis, you can say, yeah, it's a rosy analysis, but it was all there was. And so the fact that workers were able to draw on those kinds of alliances across language group, across religion, across racial category, in a setting where you know, employers were pitting workers against each other using those categories to forge alliances across that and to develop trade-based identities was actually profoundly transgressive and powerful. And it was the basis of solidarity. You know, it wasn't unalloyed didn't have the kind of impacts that you might like to see, but it was certainly powerful and more powerful, I would argue, in shaping working conditions on site than the activism of some, some of the groups that try to push for changes in the regulatory structure, because many of those push, well, many of those advocacy pushes were based on the idea implicit that workers were unskilled. And they didn't, they weren't the agentic actors that they were. Right? They were the victims of exploitation rather than the agentic actors on these construction sites. Um, you asked about skill in terms of um, employers capitalizing on the skill efforts of workers. It's, an, I think, another way of framing what you're saying. It's really interesting, you know, before the changes to the Cafela system were made, I asked uh, employers why they were so resistant to it. Like, wouldn't they, wouldn't they prefer to have a standing pool of workers that they could draw from and not have to invest so much in retraining? Because they would complain a lot about it. They would say, you know, for on a two-year contract, the first year is all training. You're not getting anything back. And almost uniformly, they all answered no. It was really interesting. One of these conversations, I did these round tables with managers because what managers will say to one another is very different than what they'll tell me or on a one-on-one. -on -one. And so the debates amongst them were really interesting. And they really felt that the danger of having reforms to the Kafela system would, would be that there would be workers in the marketplace who could take that proprietary knowledge about the training system, not the skill, to their other work site? What has happened, actually, in, the, in light of the reforms is not that workers are able to change jobs. For a lot of reasons, they're not, including the fact that they don't have the ability to move through the city freely. Um, you know, they are reported for absconding, and that leads to deportation. And what has happened is that employers are holding on to their workers and moving them from project to project. So they're hired by a different employer, but it's really the same company, or it's another company in the same supply chain. So they're not actually moving across companies. They're not, workers are not freely choosing different jobs, but employers are able to hold on to their training systems a little bit longer. Um, so, right. And so workers' ability to use that investment in training for their own purposes to say, if we, weren't, we won't work 16 hours a day, that, you know, it's, it's not transformative, but it is something. And I think in many respects, it kept workers alive. Um, okay. And then you asked me to comment about 
kind of the, the geopolitics of the Gulf and Qatar and where it fits and who the Qataris are and how global capital comes into this. And it's a really messy story. Um, I think um, Qatar is hard to analyze if you use the concept of Qatar in a funny way. Like Qatar is a Qatar as a nation didn't exist until 1970. And it is a product, actually, the, the idea of a Qatar nation is a product of a struggle between the British and the Americans over oil in the Persian Gulf. And so much of these struggles, actually, even the holding of the World Cup are a product of these struggles to ensure that Saudi Arabia and before then, uh, the US through Aramco, which is Saudi, the big Saudi oil company, didn't just swallow up Qatar and its oil fields. And you know, there's that perpetual danger of Saudi Arabia just swallowing up Qatar. Um, you know, and the, there was a the big embargo against Qatar was, in a way, you know, the Saudis and the UAE saying we can swallow you up whenever we want. And so, holding the World Cup is a way of saying we are a standalone nation with a separate identity. You cannot swallow us up. You cannot take our natural gas fields. I mean, Qatar is tiny, you know, like it's 100,000 people, 200,000 on a good day, right? Uh, apart from its foreign workers. Um, all of those kind of back and forth struggles around um, what Qatar is, who Qatar is, who is Qatari, who's not Qatari, have in some ways profoundly been tethered to production, the production of global commodities, whether it's pearls or whether it's oil, and now in some sense, natural gas and cultural experience. Um, and those distinctions between skill and unskilled have been really enduring. And here I mean the politics around it have been really enduring. And I'll just give you one quick example. Um, during pearling, at the tail end of pearling in the 1930s um, and into the development of Qatar's oil fields by the British, um, there were uh, regular uh, kind of attempts by enslaved workers to seek manumission by going to make appeals on British frigates. And the British adjudicated those appeals not based on the testimony of the person appealing, but based on their body, based on the wounds that they had sustained. Uh, and those physical marks of exploitation became the distinction. That mattered. So here we have these workers are unskilled. They can't speak for themselves. They have no agency. Um, and we will not acknowledge their enslavement unless it's under our terms. That mattered because the British oil company used enslaved workers until slavery was abolished in 1952 in Qatar. Right, so all of these skill distinctions were fundamental to the definition of rights, to the definition of who could move, to the definition of who would have bodily integrity. In the end, um, and here I'll close, you asked me why I looked at skill. I looked at skill uh, because skill is the marrow of production. It's where we see the power dynamics play out, who can exercise autonomy, whose expertise is valued, who, is, um, who gets to structure production, who's remunerated and in what way. But that's a really traditional understanding of skill. That's the understanding of skill that I went in with. The understanding of skill that I emerged with is a political category of skill that has really very little correspondence with actual ability. It's not a denial of ability. You know, it's not a mislabeling of skilled workers as unskilled. Some workers were unskilled. It is the, it's about the political consequences of being labeled unskilled, right? Like the fact that you are denied the human registers that are associated with sentience. And that is very visible in Qatar because of the fact that uh, people's political rights were co-equal with their economic function, but it is not unique to Qatar. 
And it is, it, it, if we pay attention, we can see it in every single cap capitalist economy in the world. And I think I'll, I'll end there if that's okay. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, so we have a couple questions in the chat and um, <clears throat> here I just wanna open it up to the rest of the audience. So feel free to uh, put your question in the chat or raise your hand and uh, I will call on you. Uh, so we have a first question from Sabira Serigjanova who uh, says, thank you so much for bringing light to the conditions of labor migrants in Qatar. Did you face any challenges in getting access to construction sites in the country? Oh, Natasha, you're muted. So I, I, I will address this question of access to construction sites. And I see that the second question is about kind of the profile of workers. Um, and they're not unrelated questions. Um, and I'll just say that the book is about workers in Qatar, but in some really profound ways, it's about gender. It's about men. Like these were, not only was the workforce uh, almost 100% male, but the spaces were 100% male. So the work sites were 100% male, but workers were also segregated um, and they were confined to an area zoned uh, for industrial use, kind of housed in worker barracks that were right next to cement, cement plants and things like that. And the industrial area, which you know uh, holds like 650,000 workers, it's like a four kilometer area, 100% male. Like that's a small city, 100% male. And that, I, it really shapes the politics, the experience. One of the things that was really striking about it was um, the relations of care that emerged and how they were gendered differently because there were no women. I mean, it was just really remarkable. Um, but what that meant in terms of access and in terms of the kinds of conversations I was able to have about work, about the politics of skill and its valence was that, um, men unburdened themselves, right? These were young men who many of them had left home for the first time, who were in these spaces where they were trying to not be vulnerable. And then the door would close and they were with kind of an auntie type character. And they would just, I mean, you could, the, the, the costs of the politics were described in really intimate terms. Um, and, I, and the other thing that was really important to note, and this is related to the question of access, I really don't think I would have been able to do the work safely if I hadn't been a woman. And the reason is that, you know, climbing up on these scaffolds, which I did, and going into these welding stations, which I did, and all sorts of other things, it's really dangerous and hard. And they took such good care of me. And if I were a man, I'm not sure that they would have taken such good care of me. And I think to some extent, my safety uh, was because I was a woman and they took such good care of me, you know, like triple checking my harness kind of thing. Um, I think that was an important thing. And then in terms of, you know, that's just the nuts and bolts of getting access I will say, uh, you know, it, it was a complicated process. I started from the top down and it took a year of just back and forth trips and negotiation uh, before I really even started the field work to get access. It's fascinating. Thanks, Natasha. So we have a hand up from Roger. Hi, sorry, I wanted to unmute myself. So uh, uh, thanks, uh, Natasha, uh, for uh, that terrific presentation. Thanks, uh, Vanessa, for the comment. It's uh, you've you produced another beautifully written book, uh, Natasha. It's really a pleasure to uh, to read it, and I, I heartily recommend it to everyone uh, on the call. But uh, reading the book, and I'm even more so listening to you. I, I guess I see a tension between. Your the argument at the initial stage of the book, uh, rather of the talk, and also on the book, in which you're contending that it really isn't the kafala system itself that is that is at the source of the difficulties that the workers uh, encounter, 
uh, but uh, and and then you know you you go on to emphasize as you you know did in in describing this incredible building that uh, the the pictures of which you showed us you 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 emphasize extraordinary amounts of skill that the workers possessed but uh, if indeed they have so much skill why is it that they're so powerless i mean in your explanation of the i mean that a skill uh, if indeed they're so skilled, then they're not immediately replaceable. That losing these workers from one, I mean, it, as you pointed out, they can be sent home within a matter of 24 hours, but even less. But that then presumes that there's somebody who can step into the, de, into the departed workers' uh, place without any cost to the employer, without any disruption. And, you know, as you as you know, I mean, it's inherent in the, and as you, as we saw from the pictures, you showed us it's inherent in this type of work that people are working together. It's not an assembly line. People have to work cooperatively as teams. And wait, another question is how do they do that if they don't speak the same language? But in any case, I mean, skill is not just then an attribute of the of an individual worker. It's an attribute of the of the workers at teams, which suggests that therefore that getting rid of someone will will have an even greater disruptive impact. So. Uh, if they're so skilled, why is it that they're so replaceable? And 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 uh, I mean, since all I mean for uh, since uh, for all practical purposes, the entire Qatari workforce consists of foreigners. Why is it that these foreign workers are treated so terribly, and the executives, managers, etc., find themselves you know at a higher level of the occupational structure, are treated? Much more, much more decently are, are allowed to bring in their families. Aren't I mean, in theory, sure they could be sent home in 24 hours, but that's not a way to continue to recruit high-level managers. So, is it really uh, that the uh, it's the politics of the? Is it really that the politics of a, the a te these temporary worker programs that those politics are not crucial, but it's rather the politics of skill and. If these workers are so skilled, why can they be gotten rid of so easily? So that's a really great question. And I think it actually helps me address the question that um, Vanessa asked me about book writing. Um, I, I think one of the challenges for me when I came back from Qatar was that all of my frameworks for understanding the data I had collected were based on um, a system, were based on economies where uh, the idea that workers were individuals who could act as free agents was kind of a core assumption. Like, what does it, what does a system where everyone is bonded look like in terms of its implications for production? It took me a really long time to actually shift gears there. So I don't wanna say that it doesn't matter that people were working under the Kafela system. It certainly was the envelope, but that wasn't the main um, mechanism through which workers were exploited, used, whatever. I also think that this view of the labor market as a market, which is not the case in Qatar, right? There, Really, for that decade in which the World Cup was being built, there was no market. It was a labor force, right? There's no market that you, where you could buy and sell your labor in any kind of free way and no market where employers could buy or sell that labor in a free way. Workers who were not employed disappeared, right? They were, it was a labor force. That really forced me to rethink what I understood about skill as skill. Right, And the extent to which we talk about skill as being collectively generated and collectively held, but we fundamentally still view it as human capital. Where, you know, a worker takes it with him, and here I'm using gendered language because that was the case there, takes it with him and then leaves a gap that then needs to be filled with kind of equivalent skill, but that actually wasn't the system. The, the whole thing was a collective expression of skill and the churn was constant. 
so that what you had was systems that were designed to cultivate skill on an ongoing basis, even with that churn. You always had new workers arriving and you had workers who had been there a while moving into different roles, becoming mentors, uh, and, and the, the introduction of new workers was part of that training system. So I don't, I don't think, I mean, it, it really is, does not look the way that we uh, assume skill looks in a place where you have a labor market. And one of the things that has been useful and difficult about this book is that it's really forced me to disentangle what we what is actually uh, a description of a of a labor market and what is actually a description of the way that work happens we end up conflating the two because in most of the settings that we study we have those two things superimposed but when they aren't superimposed we have to rethink and that rethinking process was the most difficult process for me in analyzing the data none of the data fit the models that I was used to thinking in. And, um, you know, I don't know how successfully I got to the end of that thinking process, but it certainly forced me to rethink a whole lot of things, including um, kind of the um, our embodiment as workers and what it means. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Natasha. I have a question. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, listening to you uh, on the podcast today explained uh, uh, that talked about Qatar and, <clears throat> and, and these very questions. And one of the things that I remember you talking about that I found really interesting as a political scientist was that those wildcat, wildcat strikes they allowed uh, they would allow as long as certain conditions held. And one of those was well, they would only be held by one nationality. And uh, there's a lot of uh, work on how the, the Chinese Communist Party does that. They allow protests to happen as long as it's localized. And, um, and, and so just, it, it's, I was wondering whether um, there, are, there are other, th this is the way in, this is one of the ways in which um, the, these workers were kept powerless uh, what would, were they living only with folks from their nationality? Were there other ways in which they were kept segregated and weren't allowed to mingle and to create this kind of cross group solidarity? Yeah, I mean, you know, there was some of it was definitely segregation by by ethnicity or language in in the housing accommodations in the in the worker accommodations, uh, and that was definitely engineered by employers. But one of the things I found really fascinating was, I, I don't know a different term for it other than like for lack of a better term, urban legends that the employers were really active and managers were really active in cultivating like. Um, things that were ridiculous, like on one site, the managers kept telling uh, workers from other nationalities that the Vietnamese were cannibals and not to talk to them because, right, that they would uh, take them and kill them and eat them. It was just like ridiculous things would happen, right? Like, or uh, things like employers would give, um, you know, one religion and it changed by site, depending on who the nationality and the religion of the managers uh, they would get uh, a day of rest for a religious holiday, but the other religions wouldn't, or uh, some, if the, there was um, similar nationality between managers and workers, then those workers might get preferential treatment, right, or the kind of the health and safety staff, health and safety staff were primarily disciplinary staff, and how they disciplined worker activities uh, also uh, was very much shaped by uh, religion, race, national origin, and very deliberately so. Things like, um, you know, once the Qatari government uh, mandated electronic payments, uh, a lot of the companies developed systems where they would hold workers' ATM cards uh, so that they couldn't withdraw their salaries and transfer them home. 
Um, and they did that also based on nationality. Okay, so today we're going to let the Indian workers get their money and we're not going to let the Nepali workers get their money. The other really fundamental thing is that until actually like a month before the World Cup, wages were indexed to nationality, not to, not to job. So you had workers doing the exact same job, getting paid radically different wages based on uh, based on their nationality and based on the perceived level of poverty in the country of origin. So for example, Nepalis would get paid two thirds of what their Indian coworkers would earn, even though they were working side by side, even though often the Nepalis may have been on the site longer and were more skilled. Those kinds of divisions were deliberate. And in fact, employers did this, but the Qatari government was very um, deliberate in doing so as well. So they would say, uh, they would manage the visa allocation to ensure that there was national diversity on every single site. Thank you. It's it's like mildly evil, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the, the political scientist in me is <laughs> fascinated, but yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Suzanne Modell. Oh, sorry, Professor Modell, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I think many of us have been aware of these abuses, and it's really quite mind boggling that such terrible abuses can continue, and essentially, we continue to support it. Uh, I'd like to ask a, a question about source country, uh, change the direction a little bit. As I understood that you said that you had visited, you had done interviews at Origin as well as in Qatar. Um, and this is always a mystery to me, is how, uh, given the dreadful conditions that you describe, uh, that people would continue to go to such a place. Now, we know that uh, in days when communication was not as it is today, uh, that, that many times migrants would not tell the truth um, about, they would not convey the realities of the suffering that they endured and, oh yes, the streets are paved with gold. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little uh, about, uh, first of all, uh, what your sense is about um, what, what this is also temporary, right? Is there some return migration? Returnees would be the ones who, who knew the best about what they were getting into. Um, and over and above that, uh, to what extent uh, do the people who are thinking about migration um, know, know the truth? To what extent do they discount it? Um, whatever about this process uh, you can tell us, I think would be interesting. So I, I just start with um, saying that one of the really fascinating things about doing these interviews that is that um, just as I was interpreting workers, they were interpreting me. And a lot of them initially thought that I was a human rights worker. So they would start with the litany of like, oh, I haven't gotten paid in six weeks or, oh, this abuse happened or whatever. And then, you know, I'd kind of take those answers and shift the discussion a little bit to like, what were they proudest of? And uh, what was their most meaningful experience? And what was their most difficult day? And um, the interview really opened up and it became something different. And so I'm not sure that I would say that these experiences were uniformly terrible. I mean, in the sense of like, the workers were really proud of what they accomplished. You know, I mean, they they knew that they had built these extraordinary structures and they felt tremendous pride about it. And um, the exploitative practices were also interwoven with a whole host of other things. And so I'm not sure that the practice that it, that it's accurate to say that these were uniformly exploitative, nor do I think it's accurate to say they're unique? You know, I mean, as Vanessa's work shows us very clearly, these are, there's a continuum here across economies. Um, but uh, I think there is, you know, one of the things that I found really striking in doing interviews in Nepal and India and the Philippines is that everybody knew exactly what the working conditions were except for the heat, which is a different piece because it was unimaginable to people until they had experienced it in many cases. But not only did they know what the working conditions were, they knew who the good companies were. 
right? Like this is really granular information. Where that granular information fell apart was in recruitment. And um, here I don't mean to portray recruiters as these evil actors. I think that that's not actually, actually accurate. I think it's a much more complex story than that. In fact, many of the recruiters I talked with visited companies in Qatar to make sure that the working conditions were, work, were produced jobs that they could sell in Nepal. Um, but what happened was that these big recruitment agencies would get orders for 500 workers uh, within three weeks, and these orders would come in on a rolling basis, and workers would also seek jobs on a rolling basis. And there was no option to match yourself with a good company. You just got whichever company had placed an order at the time that you were applying for a job. Like your agency in choosing your employer was just structurally not there. And so workers often ended up um, in employers that were different from the ones that they would have liked. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything about better or worse, but workers had very granular information about which companies were good and um, which companies had which particular kinds of labor violations. Okay, well, I, I guess my, my main takeaway from that is, well, you can't have it both ways. Uh, either these people were really abused and life was difficult. I mean, I realize there's a continuum, but, but at some level there isn't, I guess I would say. Uh, but also, more generally, while it may have uh, been the case uh, that these workers were working on, the, actually, um, one might even say, uh, to be able to say to your friends and neighbors, well, I worked on, a, you know, the project for the Olympics or the, uh, you know, the Soccer World Cup or something, that I can, I can imagine a certain amount of pride in that. But, but actually, this is, there's a very long story of, of, of migration of people from the countries you identify to, to the, whatever you want to call it the Middle East uh, and 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 I I would I would guess that the average person doesn't doesn't isn't able to go home if he does go home uh, and say that he he worked on some major uh wonderful uh, uh you know project so so uh, well, but I, I do think it's I think it's important I think it's important to hold on to the complexity because um there is a tendency at least there has been in some of the press coverage to emphasize the more lurid kinds of exploitation, which definitely occur. I don't want to sugarcoat it. But I think that for me, the bigger kind of structural inequity here is how is it that you have a World Cup in the wealthiest country in the world uh, built by built at the technological frontier by workers who are taking home $200 a month. That is the product of a labor force, not a labor market. And that to me is the bigger structural inequity. These other exploitative practices are uh, kind of a, a deeper reflection of that structural inequity. And I worry that sometimes the emphasis on the more uh, extreme expressions of the exploitation mean that we forget that structural inequity. And we, we assume that if we address, you know, uh, worker injury and death, if we address, you know, the fact that workers have chronic non-payment of wages and wage theft, that then we will have resolved it. That if workers get paid $200 a month uh, in the country with the highest GDP per capita, in the world by a big margin, funded by hydrocarbon revenues that are having huge impacts through the use of hydrocarbon on the countries that many of these, this, the areas many of these workers are from, that we will have just resolved it. And I, I, I feel like I don't wanna lose track of the bigger structural piece uh, because that is not unique to Qatar. And that is what Qatar can teach us. It is, you know, a kind of, um, it brings these issues into high relief, but they are not unique. And the trouble with some of the Orientalist bent of the critique is that then you can say 
this is a problem of the evil Arabs. And it is not. It is a, a problem of um, globally structured capitalism and power. And, and the final thing I'll say here, just to conclude on access, I think one of the reasons that I was able to get access is that I am an Arab woman. And that shapes, you know, that provides a little bit of a window that I won't assume that this is just evil Arabs acting in a certain kind of way. And so I, I don't know if that helped or, or not, but I, I think it was, it provided some comfort that I would start from a premise that these practices were not, as they've sometimes been portrayed, cultural. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> we have about nine minutes left. Well, okay, so if we have time, then I want to just come back to my earlier question. So I'm not certain I find your response, Natasha, fully satisfying. I mean, my so I, I understand the, the critique of human capital in the sense that it's not meaningful to think about the acquisition of skill as an investment process if, in fact, you lack the uh, capacity to... Uh, pursue the investment over uh, a lifetime's worth of work. Uh, so, in many ways, given the given the extraordinary um, vulnerability of these workers, you would think they would be loath to acquire skills, since it seems as if there's no return to it. So, uh, in a way, that's another paradox, right? That is, if in fact they are, if in fact, so much of the job entails learning, but the re sounds as if the rewards to learning are very limited, or at least the likelihood that those rewards will be continuing. You wonder why, why put in the effort? Why not simply try to hold on to the job that entails the least reward, especially as you know, the, the earnings are so low. But I, I guess my other thought is uh, if indeed, the skill level is so high, then there's then there's a hierarchy, and and that is there's somebody at the top or close to the top of the of the skill hierarchy, and and in that position, the job entails a set of competencies that were hard to obtain, and and so again, if that's true, why is that person so easily this can be so easily dismissed, and and why without any disruption to the production process. So anyway, I mean, I, you know, you've said it's all very interesting, which stimulates me to just push you further. Roger, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel like the seminar had been uh, complete if you hadn't thought, had a follow-up question. <laughs> um, I, I uh, wanna say that, um, you know, how people perceive their skill, uh, was not as a standalone thing. Like, it's not that people were making kind of calculated decisions about do I invest in skill? Do I put the effort in skill? Like, skill was absolutely a socialized process. You were, you were working on sites where, like, the option of not learning, uh, in the sense of like, uh, oh, I'm just gonna check out, was not so straightforward and wasn't really about work. I mean, one of the things that I found really uh, moving was the way that workers developed uh, kin-based, fictive kin-based relationships mapping onto skills. So they would call each other kind of big brother, little brother, uncle, son, based on where they were in the skill hierarchy. So the parsing out of skill as skill uh, as separate from social relationships actually was not so clear, right? Like in the sense of like you, your participation in the social life of the place was the same as your participation in these learning processes. Um, right. So I, I don't, I don't know that you could really opt out with also, without also opt opting out of the social processes, which, would have made your time there really difficult. So I think I think it's 
uh, nuanced in a particular kind of way. The other point you make about hierarchy is a really interesting one. Um, you know, most of the workers were there on a short-term contract, but some uh, were had their contracts renewed and that involved a particular kind of negotiation with the Qatari government to renew those visas, but it happened. And at the very top of the hierarchy for these trades were construction workers from the UK, mostly. The UK, Australia, um, sometimes South Africa, um, but basically European construction workers who had worked as scaffolders, as welders, as cladders, were at the top of the hierarchy. It wasn't the engineers. And it was precisely because, I mean, at the very top, there were the managers, but right below, there were these tradesmen, these construction workers who now in their late 40s and 50s were in Qatar, and they were all about how to design work to train. Uh, and so it was their understanding of what was involved with the work that really shaped the structure of production uh, in a way that they wouldn't have had access to in their home markets, which is really interesting, right? So like you wouldn't, I'm not sure that you would have had like a scaffolding supervisor who was, had, was more highly placed than any of the engineers and designers on the firm in a, in a UK company. And yet in Qatar that happened and it structured how work happened. It was really fascinating. Um, and I think that also shaped uh, some valences of skill on site. Um, the bigger issue is kind of what does this do for the long-term career prospects of the workers on these sites? Um, and I, I think that depends on kind of the market that people are returning to, right? Like if you're returning to Janakpur, Nepal, your employment prospects are not gonna be in construction, but there are um, ways in which workers circulate through um, different migrant labor forces in Malaysia, in the UAE, in Saudi. How possible that is, is uh, contingent on a set of institutions like the Philippines, for example, has an amazing system for um, tra making training visible in order, in order for workers to be replaced. Um, it's, the, it's called TESDA, it's the national training system. Those, those systems did allow for something of a career pathway, but I would say that that was uh, more the exception than the rule. All right, well, we are out of time. So on that note, I hope you can join me in thanking Natasha and thanking Vanessa um, for a wonderful discussion. And um, we hope to see you guys uh, on March 3rd for our next talk. Thanks, Thank everybody. You so much for having me. Thank you. Really did love the book. Nice Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks for taking the time to read it.